another series where the D backs look mediocre, but hey, at least they're in the wild card race. You are locked on Diamondbacks, your daily Arizona Diamondbacks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into the Locked on Diamondbacks podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. You're listening to who? Always charismatic host of this podcast, Miller Thomas. I'm a multimedia journalist and a graphic designer, so please go check out my website, millerthomas24.myportfolio.com. I'm there to see all my latest work from my packages to my articles to my photos and my graphic design. Today's podcast, we'll talk about the D-backs embarrassing series loss to the Detroit Tigers. We'll talk about the D-backs panic meter. It's a new segment that I want to introduce every Monday, and then we'll preview the next series against the LA Dodgers. Thank you for making Locked on Dimebacks your first listen every day. I would not be able to do this podcast without you, my loyal listeners, sharing, subscribing, reviewing, doing all that so I could do this podcast for you. Thank you. It's free. It's available on all platforms, so please continue to tell your friends. And one of those platforms is YouTube, so please hit subscribe to Locked on Dimebacks on YouTube. Our goal is to hit 2,000 subs by the All-Star break. So once again, please hit subscribe to Locked on Diamondbacks on YouTube. But now let's talk about that series loss to the Detroit Tigers because, once again, the D-backs had another series where they were going against an opponent not even that good, an opponent on the same level as the D-backs, mediocre, just kind of floundering at this point of the season. Tigers do have some things working for them in terms of their pitching staff, but they entered this series with one of the worst offenses in Major League Baseball, But this D-backs pitching staff made the Tigers look like the L.A. Dodgers of the AL Central because the Tigers came into Chase Field and really dominated this series from an offensive standpoint. And one guy who has been ridiculed over the last few years, a social media, you know, someone that gets ridiculed a lot on social media. I didn't know how far I wanted to go in terms of the adjective I was going to use to describe him. But Javier Baez is someone that a lot of people like to clown on on social media. They think he's on one, he's on one of the worst contracts in the sport, which he is. They think he's completely overrated, which he is. But in this series, Javier Baez dominated the D-backs. He had a monster series, delivered big hit after big hit, a whole lot of RBIs, and really took it to the D-backs in this series. And when you watch Arizona versus Detroit, it was all the same problems that that we have discussed all season on this podcast. It was nothing different. It was poor offense, not creating enough run scoring opportunities. It was the starting pitching falling apart late. It was the bullpen not getting enough outs and high leverage moments. Like there was so many things wrong that the D backs have done poorly this season that we saw show up once again in this series against Detroit. All the mistakes that we've seen, the D-backs have not starting... The the D-backs have not corrected their mistakes at all. It does not feel like they're getting better in terms of their habits. Like, if anything, it feels like the D-backs are moving backwards. It feels like their offense just keeps going in the wrong direction. It feels like more players in their lineup are becoming worse and worse, like the Christian Walkers of the world who are starting to enter slumps as well. You look at the rotation... You get your gallon, the Montgomery's. They're starting to struggle as they do that third time through the lineup. They kind of hit a wall. We saw Zach Gallon in game number two. He kind of hit a wall late in that game. And then you had people questioning, should we have let Zach Gallon finish out that inning? Or was it smart to bring in Joe Mansply? Would Joe Mansply even even the right option in that situation? Maybe you should just go with your best reliever in a high leverage moment like that in a Ryan Thompson. So, Big questions there. Then you look at the finale. Jordan Montgomery, the same thing. The D-back tried to pitch him late, pitch him into the seventh. He was probably done after six. We probably put him out in the game too long. Like game two, probably should have kept Zach Gallon out there to finish the inning. Jordan Montgomery probably should have been done after six innings. But then it's the same thing as we saw in game number two because people who were saying, you know what, it should have been Ryan Thompson in that situation coming in to relieve Zach Gallon instead of Joe Mantiply. What we saw in the finale, all Jordan Montgomery had to do was just allow a walk in that seventh inning. 
Then all of a sudden, Ryan Thompson, he allowed an inherited runner to score. And honestly, this whole series came down to that play because an inside the park home run, if they call that safe, the D-backs, I feel like, lose this game and get swept by the Detroit Tigers. So great job by the defense to get the ball in quick enough to get Kerry Carpenter out at the plate. But there were so many sliding door moments in this series. Do you let Zach Allen stay in the game? Do you bring in a Ryan Thompson instead of Joe Manpley? It really didn't matter what the D-backs did. It felt like they always got the worst case scenario in any situation that they chose in this series. And I think that's a bad place for the D-backs to be at. They're in a spot right now where it just feels like nothing can go right for the D-backs. It feels like whoever comes up to the plate or we're under the scoring position, it feels like they're not going to come through for you in that opportunity. It feels like when you call on a reliever to get you out the jam, it feels like they're not going to come through you for it feels like they're not going to come through for you in that moment. The trust level with a lot of these players are just at an all-time low right now if you're a D-backs fan. Uh, really like when you look up and down this lineup, when you look up and down this pitching staff, who do you feel good about? One guy is definitely Ketel Marte, who is on a what? 18 game hitting streak. I think now longest in major league baseball, like this sweep, this potential sweep was so close to actually being a sweep. Like if the D backs do not convert that out at home plate on the inside, the Parker, like, the D-backs, I think, are losing this series. The offense continues to struggle and not create enough run-scoring opportunities. They created 12 on Sunday, but only converted three of them. You look on Saturday, the D-backs created 11 opportunities, but two for 11 with runners in scoring position. And then that first game of the series just started off in a disgusting way. 0 for 7 at runners in scoring position, and you let the opposing team score 13 runs. Like, I thought Ryan Nelson on Friday was actually going to have himself a nice bounce back start. I actually thought we were going to feel good about Ryan Nelson leaving Friday's game because I thought he was going to have himself not a layup of a start because you are going against major leaguers, but if any offense could make Ryan Nelson look like a good major leaguer, I thought it was going to be the Tigers offense. I thought Ryan Nelson was going to have himself, you know, at least a competitive five and two thirds, three earned runs, six, seven strikeouts type of start and look good and make D-backs fans feel confident that, you know what, maybe Ryan Nelson isn't the worst starter in Major League Baseball. But instead, he probably had a performance that solidified the take that he could be the worst starter in Major League Baseball. I don't think Ryan Nelson is that bad, but how he looked against the Tigers on Friday, eight earned runs, 11 hits, and four innings to one of the worst teams offensively in the sport. Just this whole series, not a good job by the D-backs. Corbin Carroll, back-to-back games with a triple. You'd like to see that, but still, going one for four with a couple strikeouts every night is not going to do enough for you. Jock Peterson, love him. He is the only guy, along with Ketel Marte and probably Kevin Newman, that you can trust right now in the lineup. The Carrolls, the Christian Walkers even, the Gurriels, the Eugenios. Like, there's so many guys just not doing their job. And then with the the, the starter members in the rotation kind of struggling when they hit that sixth, seventh inning, that's not a good job either. That's a problem for the D-backs. And then the relievers, the bullpen, not being able to convert high leverage outs late in the game. Also, a big problem for this D-backs team. The D-backs have just so many issues that we've seen them, you know, not correct throughout the course of the season. And we keep saying they need to correct these issues. If this team has any chance of making it to the postseason, their only saving grace is the third wild card spot is wide open. And so we're going to talk about it in segment number two. We're going to actually put a number on the panic meter for how we feel about the D-back season because D-backs after... Sunday, they are currently three games below 500, 22 and 25 on the season. They are outside looking in on the wild card race. It's not looking too good. The vibes are definitely not up right now, but at least the D-backs are still within a game of the wild card race. I guess that's the silver lining. And so we'll put a number on the panic meter for the D-back season so far in segment number two. If you're trying to see that ROI on your money, then the best tool to use is, of course, 
Yahoo Finance because when it comes to your financial future, you think you've done it all. You've saved, you've researched, you've invested all that you can. Now you need to take those investments to the next level by using what every financial great uses, Yahoo Finance. For more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every great investor. Whether you're a seasoned investor or you're looking for that extra guidance, Yahoo Finance gives you all the tools and data you need in one place. They are the number one finance destination, producing a holistic look at the financial news cycle, including breaking news, original editorial perspectives, analyst ratings, independent research, customizable charts, and so much more. Security link your brokerage accounts for a unified view of your wealth, including 401k and other investments. A comprehensive perspective is what sets apart great investors. And it's how Yahoo Finance ensures you have the insight to look at your wealth in its entirety. With a community of over 90 million users each month, their real strength is helping you on your way to financial success. For a comprehensive financial news and analysis, visit the brand behind every great investor, yahoofinance.com, their number one financial destination, yahoofinance.com. That's yahoofinance.com. And if you need any help with your insurance, then I suggest Policy Genius because it's the country's leading online insurance marketplace. It saves you time and money so you can provide your family with a financial safety net starting today. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer same day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius helps you compare your options from top companies and their team of licensed experts is on hand to help you talk through it. Talk to a team of award-winning agents who will walk you through the process step by step. Your work life insurance policy may not offer enough protection for your family's needs. Even worse, it may not come with you if you leave your job. Check life insurance off your to-do list in no time with Policy Genius. Head to policygenius.com slash MLB or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com slash MLB. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back into the Locked On Dimebacks podcast. And we're doing a new weekly segment because I think it's time to unveil. We are, what, 50 games into the season now. We've seen a pretty large sample size from the D-backs so far this season. And obviously, the year has not gone the D-backs way. We came into the year with pretty good expectations. D-backs, of course, coming off the World Series. They improved the team, as so we thought, in the offseason. You upgraded third base, as so we thought. You upgraded the rotation, as so we thought. We thought the offense was going to be better. It hasn't been. We thought we are going to see some year two improvements from some of the players or, you know, just internal improvements from some of these players. We have not outside maybe like a Brandon Fodd or something like that. And a lot of guys who had great seasons last year have just not returned the same investment this season. And so when you look at the D-backs, when you think about how they're playing now versus the expectations that we had for them entering the season, when you look at all the variables that have happened in 2024, what's the panic level for the D-backs so far? It's still early. We're still only about 50 games into the season, but D-backs after 50 games, you know, if this was the 2020 season, we would say the D-backs are going to miss the postseason. And even if they do make it, we would say they are not a good playoff team. And so right now, as it currently stands on May 19th slash May 2020, the D-backs, I'm putting their panic level at a six. It's not... It's not DEFCON 1 just yet. We're not on the precipice of a nuclear holocaust or anything like that. I, I think there's cause for concerns. I think there's like a, you know, like a six earthquake outside. Like you can feel the shaking. Your house is moving for sure. But is there extensive damage? Are people dying? Probably not. You know, there could be an injury or two if someone fell on the sidewalk. You know, your grandma wasn't ready for the earthquake, so she fell down and hurt her hip. Yeah, that's possible. And so for the D-backs, I would say panic meter at a six right now. 
mostly because it's still so early in the season. And really, that wild card spot is wide open because as the D backs continue to look awful, there's still only one game back of that third wild card spot as I'm recording this podcast at 8 07 p.m. on May 19th. And the team that they're battling for that third wild card spot is probably going to be an NL West team. The Padres own it right now, the Giants are second ahead of the D-backs, and then the D-backs are right there, who are currently actually a game and a half back of the wild card spot. And the D-backs, fun fact, negative run differential now, minus one. For a long time, they've been in that positive run differential, mostly because they've had so many large offensive performances where they put up big runs and big offensive outputs, but now it has all evened out. And so you can say, D-backs, three games below 500 with a negative run differential, they are just not a good baseball team right now. That's why the panic meter is at a six. And if they continue to play like this and we get toward the all-star break and trade deadline, the panic meter will rise. Now, the question is, will the panic meter rise to the point where the D-backs need to be sellers or will it rise to the point where it's like, you know what, let's go make a move because even though the D-backs aren't good, they're still white right there in the wild card race and maybe one more player can help us in the second half of the season. So still big question marks for the D-backs. Uh, of course, obviously, health is still a big one. We'll see where we put the panic meter as the D-backs start to get healthy in the second half. But as it currently stands, it feels like we're probably going to be at a six for the foreseeable future. We need the D-backs to build some momentum in a series, in a couple of series, for us to feel good about this season turning around at all, right? Because the D-backs just a couple, you know, 10 days ago, they were riding that four-game win streak coming off that potential series sweep, and then actually see, uh, actually sweeping the Reds, uh, the, the series right after, right? I believe they beat the Padres in that potential series sweep. Then they sweep the Reds right after for a four-game winning streak. And then so you're questioning yourself after that, like are the D-backs finally starting to turn it around a little bit on a four-game winning streak? Is the season finally starting to get better for the D-backs? And I always said, even in that moment, the answer was no because we just saw so much already from this year of a pretty large sample size of the D-backs not being good. Plus, at the time, the Reds were on a pretty long losing streak themselves. Like, it, was, it, it wasn't it was easy for us to exactly believe that that four-game winning streak by the D-backs was actually the turning point in their season. And for those of us that didn't believe, ended up being right because it was not the turning point in their season. They went into Baltimore. They got embarrassed by Baltimore. They are now getting embarrassed by the Detroit Tigers of the world. They'll probably get embarrassed by the LA Dodgers. The panic meter is a six because of the wild card race and how early it is in the season. But it, even if the wild card race, if the D-backs were like five, six games back of the wild card race, I would put the panic meter at maybe like a seven, seven and a half. The only reason it's a six right now is because that third wild card spot is so wide open. And for the D-backs moving forward, uh, some things that you do question about this team if they're ever going to turn it around. I mean, we've hit so many of the big questions about this team over the last couple of weeks on this podcast. But one thing I do want to know is what happened to Corbin Carroll's speed. We've talked about his offense disappearing. But one other thing of his game that has also kind of disappeared a little bit is his speed. And I'm not just talking about, like, why aren't you being as aggressive on the base pass? Like, where are all the steals? Uh, obviously a guy like Ella Dela Cruz already has like 85 stolen bases on the season. Cormac Carroll does have eight stolen bases, but I think he's been caught stealing four times now on the year, which is just insane. And the scariest part about when I asked the question, what happened to Cormac Carroll's speed? There's also Imperial evidence to support the notion I just made, because you look at stat cast sprint speed, which tracks it all. Corbin Carroll, the last couple of years, was a top three, arguably the fastest. It was always like him or Bobby Witt, who's the fastest guy in baseball the last couple of years. Corbin Carroll this year, Bobby Witt's still number one. A guy like Ella De La Cruz, he's number five. Corbin Carroll is all the way down at number 29 currently on the season in terms of sprint speed. He's not even considered the fastest player on the D-backs, according to StatCast. Jake McCarthy is actually 25th in the ranking while Corbin Carroll is number 29. So 
Not even Corey McCarro is the fastest player on the D-backs anymore. That title actually goes to Jake McCarthy. So that's why I'm like, where has the Corey McCarro speed been this season? It's not just the fact that he's not getting as many steals as he used to. It's the fact that he's actually not as fast as he once was. And if his bat is also not as good, like what version of Corey McCarro are we going to get over the next few years? Are we getting a little appetizer to the future of what Corbin Carroll is actually going to be like, should we look at last year as a fluke? I think it's still too early to say yes to any of those questions, but you can't help, but uh, you can't help, but say that the sample size for Corbin Carroll in 2024 is already getting pretty large. And there seems to be no signs of Corbin Carroll starting to turn around his season he has not put together the string of games where it's like, okay, Corbin Carroll is starting to wake up. And like we always say, this D-backs team is going nowhere if we don't get last year's Rookie of the Year winner. If we don't get last year's Corbin Carroll, this D-backs team is going nowhere. And right now, we're not getting the offensive player that Corbin Carroll was. We're not even getting the speedster that Corbin Carroll was. And so I don't know how you can expect this D-backs offense to go anywhere if your best player is doing absolutely nothing at the plate. And so like what we've been saying all year long on this podcast, this D-backs team goes as Corbin Carroll goes, and we're praying this next series against the LA Dodgers, Corbin Carroll can finally start to wake up that offensive bat. Are you struggling to close deals? B2B selling is tougher than ever, and that's why I want to tell you guys about LinkedIn Sales Navigator. LinkedIn Sales Navigator is a sales intelligence platform that helps professionals effectively prospect and engage high-value customers, drive higher revenue, and increase sales performance. Sales Navigator helps you target the right buyers, surface key signals such as job changes or which accounts you should prioritize, and shows you hidden allies so you can find those buyers that are most likely to convert. Fueled by LinkedIn's 1 billion member platform, Sales Navigator gives you the most up-to-date first-party data, enabling you to unlock conversations with the people that matter. Right now, you can try LinkedIn Sales Navigator and get a 60-day free trial at linkedin.com slash locked on. That is linkedin.com slash locked on for a 60-day free trial. Let LinkedIn Sales Navigator help you sell like a superstar today. Just go to linkedin.com slash locked on and get started. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back into the Locked on Dimebacks podcast. Let's talk about the D-backs versus Dodgers series because it is not looking good for the D-backs in this next series because, of course, they're going against the LA Dodgers, one of the best teams in Major League Baseball, one of the best, one of the best offenses as well. And the D-backs right now do not have the horses to go in this series, so much so that they're actually starting an opener in Monday's game. We're going to see Joe Mantiply on the mound against the LA Dodgers. Slade Ciccone was probable for that start. He is available out the bullpen. I must say, I am a guy that is not a fan of the opener situation. I just feel like it just does not work. I want to see a traditional starter. Call me conservative in that standpoint, but I like traditional baseball, and I just feel like going with a reliever just doesn't work out, especially when your reliever that you're throwing out there, not exactly a flamethrower. It's not like we're starting the game. Like it's Justin Martinez who has wicked movement and is pounding a hundred miles an hour in the strike zone. Like a Joe Mantiply who is prone to be Joe multiply at times and give up some meatballs in the middle of that zone. And so Mantiply going against his vaulted Dodgers lineup. Like you can't even make the case like, Oh, yeah, they got Freddie and Otani like they're lefties. Like, it doesn't matter. They also got Mookie Betts and the Will Smiths of the world. And they got so many dudes who are offensive superstars. And Teoscar Hernandez is like, there's so many good players. Like, it doesn't even matter if it was a lefty or a righty starting the game for the D-backs. I'm just more upset that they're starting a reliever at all. Like, if you do think Slade is healthy enough to be available out the bullpen for you guys, and you do envision him coming into the game, or like if he's going to be the first guy in the game after Joe Mantiply comes out after the first inning, then why not just start the game with a Slade Ciccone? I just don't understand doing this song and dance of let's put a reliever out there first and then bring in the guy that we actually was going to start originally. I just don't like that philosophy. Or just start a Bryce Jarvis. I know he's been shaky 
all season long, but he's the other guy that's the counterpart to a Slate Ciccone as the long reliever, as the spot starter. We've seen Bryce Jarvis make starts for the D-backs before. I would much rather him just start the game, whether he sucks or not. Like, as soon as the game starts to go away from him, then you could, you know, bring in your Joe Mantiply or whatever, or even bring in your Slate Ciccone after that, and maybe you're just attacking the game with two guys that could potentially be a starting pitcher for you. I just don't like the idea of starting a reliever Never been a fan of it. Would rather the D-backs just start Bryce Jarvis or Slate Ciccone in game number one. In game number two, thank God we got Brandon Fott going in this series because, like I said, Dodgers are throwing out Yamamoto in game one against Manthply. They're also throwing out Glass now in game number three against Ryan Nelson. So we're going to need Brandon Fott to step up in a big way in game number two. D-backs are going to need Brandon Fott to continue this Recent run of dominance he's been on, racking up a uh, a whole bunch of Ks. That sweeper looking absolutely nasty. D-backs need Brandon Fott. They need him. They need uh, need him because they are trying to keep pace in this wild card standings. That's like the best case scenario for the D-backs leaving this series. Can you win at least one game and just stay within a couple of games of that final wild card spot? D-backs... The vibes are bad right now for the team. But a win against the Dodgers, like, listen, if you sweep the Reds, I'm not saying your series, I'm not saying your season's turning around. But if you sweep the Dodgers or at least take two out of three against the Dodgers in convincing fashion, then I raise my eyebrow. Then I'm like, you know what? Maybe the D-backs are starting to build a little bit uh, bit of momentum. Probably need to see a larger sample size than just one series, but... Could be the beginning of something new if the D-backs are at least able to beat the Dodgers in this upcoming series. Would love to see Will Smith finally get slowed down because he has crushed the D-backs in his whole career. And I hate Will Smith. So I would love the D-backs to see, uh, would love the D-backs to slow him down because he's crushed us. Need the offense to either come through in game number one or three. I trust Brendan Fott. I think the offense just needs to deliver a clutch hit in game number two. Bullpen needs to clutch it out in game number two because I think Brandon Fott would put us in position to win game number two. But the offense, I think, needs to be the MVP in either game one or game number three. If the D-backs are able, if the D-backs want to win the series, I think they need a huge eight-run performance or more in game one or three. And then you pray Brandon Fott could deliver you a gem in game number two and the bullpen can do enough and the offense late in the game can do just enough as well. Ketel Marte, we know he's going to show up, but who else from the lineup is going to show up and help out Ketel Marte? That is a huge question. He needs a couple running mates. You can't just have Marte out there. He needs two, three other guys coming along with him for the ride. Four other guys coming along with him for the ride. That Dodgers lineup, one through nine, everyone puts in work. The same can't be said for the D-backs lineup. So we're going to need to see a bigger offensive explosion from the D-backs. Someone help out Ketel Marte because going against the Dodgers, we know they're going to score a whole lot of runs. And with the Ryan Nelson's pitching and the Joe Mansplies pitching, we're going to need to see a big offensive performance from the D-backs in at least game one or game number three if they want any chance of winning this upcoming series. Now, that's it for this edition of the Locked on Dimebacks podcast. Come back tomorrow for more Dimebacks news coverage and insight. And as always, we'll talk after the D-backs beat the Dodgers in game one Monday night. Doses.